Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Aaron. Um, and so, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, let's just get started. This is going to be a talk on um, music. What is music? How do you write music? What makes music work? Um, and we're going to kind of delve into some of the, you know, basics of music, like sheet music, notes, rhythms, that kind of stuff, and then go into music theory, look at chords, um, how those work, harmony, look at what makes a good melody, um, and then I'm going to actually go and compose something live uh, with all of your input on how we're going to make it go. Um, and then at the end, we'll get into some production stuff, you know, once you actually have a piece of music, how do you, you know, turn it into a, a finished project that you can go and use in your games. Um, so I'm going to be covering a lot. Um, it's it, might feel like drinking from a fire hose, um, especially if you don't have a lot of previous musical experience. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try my best. If you have any questions at any time, please raise your hand, ask a question. Um, I want to help explain as best as I can. Um, so yeah, I think uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so a bit about me. My name is Aaron Fisher. Um, I'm a sophomore in graphic design, although I was in aerospace engineering up until this semester. So. Um, I'm kind of working my way through the design core right now. I've um, been writing music for seven years. I started when I was in eighth grade, um, and I've continued on and off since then. Um, so, you know, kind of been a journey. My first instrument uh, was piano, which I picked up. I, pick up. I started taking lessons in third grade. Um, so, and I've, I stopped taking lessons a while after that, but kept, kind of kept with it, keep playing it. Um, chose clarinet when I uh, started band. And stop. And then uh, when I got to high school, I switched to sousaphone for marching band. Um, and that's what I do here in the Iowa State University Cyclone Football Varsity Marching Band. Um, so basics of music. So we're going to go look at notes, rhythms, and sheet music. Um, our basic thing of music is the note. It's the kind of the basic building block of music. Um, there are 12 of them. They each have their own name. Um, and you can see seven of them right here. So got A, B, D, e, D, E, F, G, and then back up to A. So um, um, let's see. So each of these notes corresponds to a line or a space on this staff right here. So like A um, takes this open spot, B goes on this middle line, see the next open spot, um, and so on and so forth. And it's the same thing for uh, the bass clef. Um, but what about the other five notes? I said there were 12. Um, so what you can do, and what we do do, is um, we can make notes flat or sharp. And what that means is so for, say we're, we're uh, making a note flat, we go down a half step. So you see on the piano, um, actually, let me. So, A right now, if we want to make it flat, we go down a half step to this black key right here, and we call that A flat. Um, you can also make it sharp. So, we're on A again, you can go up a half step to A sharp. Um, and so, we have all of these black notes right here. Um, that are, we also call them accidentals. Um, sometimes you play them accidentally when <laughs> you don't want to. But, um, so this leads to something interesting which can be a little counterintuitive at first for beginners. G sharp and A flat are the same pitch. So you start on G, you go up a half step to G, start on A, go down a half step to A flat. That's the same pitch. Um, they're not the same note. Um, we can argue about it later. <laughs> Um, so our next thing about music is rhythms. So let me um, let me start a metronome right here. So um, along with pitch, the notes also. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What's up? That's a great question. Um, so so because we have twelve notes, if we had. Um, let me do some math here. Seven white notes. 
be 14 notes, and there's only 12 in the scale. Um, now, if we play music with 14 notes instead of 12, like in an octave, um, then yeah, that would be what we'd have. But because we have 12, then we have to have some gaps in between the white notes where there's no black keys. Um, okay, so. It does, yes. So E sharp, I mean, yeah, you can say E sharp, um, it's the same note as F, uh, same pitch as F. And actually, if you're working in a key such as F, or you're working in, say, uh, C sharp, you have C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F sharp, G sharp. Um, that's because that's how you want to spell the keys. Um, so yeah, you, you do have E sharp or, say, C flat. Um, it's just, that's more of an uncommon thing, but yeah, it's a totally valid way of writing that note. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so back to rhythms. Um, um, so they also have durations that are relative to the beat. Um, the beat is what you'd like tap your foot along to when you're listening to music. So, you know, it's kind of this repetitive rhythm thing right here. Um, kind of the underlying <laughs> pulse in the music. Um, and so from that, we can assign notes a value of how long uh, they would last. So um, a quarter note, uh, kind of probably the most basic of the, of the um, note values. It's a beat. So right now we're listening to quarter quarter notes. Sorry, four quarter notes. Um, but we also have, and that's, that's this one right here. Um, but we also have like a half note. So that'd be the yeah, last two beats. Um, or we could have eighth notes, which would last for half of a beat. And then so over here, we have 16th notes and 32nd notes. Um, 16th notes, you'll see sometimes 32nd notes never. They're really fast. Um, but it's this kind of, it's the subdivision or, or um, I guess, multiplication of the beat that we get these notes from. Um, these down here are also eighth notes, and these are sixteenth notes. When you put them together, uh, they kind of connect with each other just to make it easier to read when you're um, playing music. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we just kind of like innately do when we're listening to a beat is we divide these pulses into strong beats and we divide them into weak beats. And so, say in this measure right here where we have four beats. Um, in a measure, um, we're going to find that first beat and that third beat to be the strong ones and the second and fourth to be the weak ones. So like you can hear um, every four kind of dings. That's like signifying that's like the strongest one of the four. And then you'd also have the third one also be strong. So like, and so when we're on this one, that's also another of the strong beats. You can kind of think this, think of this as how like a, we, you hear a, a clock go, um, and it goes like tick, tock, tick, tock. Um, that's just, you know, say the sound doesn't really change, but you still hear it kind of going between tick and talk. Um, so yeah, just a fundamental part of how we perceive music. So now that um, we understand these things on a basic level. We can look at a, a piece of sheet music and understand kind of what it's doing. Um, so, you know, this is for piano. Um, it's really, it started as instructions on how to perform music. So a composer would, you know, have a musical idea um, and they would write it down and they would give it to their musicians and they would read it and they'd understand how to play it based on um, the instructions here. So, you know, you see we have eighth notes, half notes, quarter notes. Um, the various pitches on the staff. You can kind of think of sheet music as like a graph of pitch over time, in a sense. Um, it's at its most fundamental level. That's what you could see it to be. Um, but we could also think of it as a representation of music. So we can use it to visualize um, music without actually having to hear it. We can just look at it. Um, and so, you know, stuff like this is a treble clef, it's a bass clef. Um, this whole thing is called a staff. Um, in between these bar lines right here is a measure, um, that kind of thing. So um, moving on to keys, um, we can think of these as a group of pitches that we use to form the basis for a composition. So um, when you're uh, using, um, when you're creating music, 
you're going to usually stick to a specific set of seven notes um, that you use to make your scale. And this is totally not true. You always can break those rules um, and use more than seven pitches. But it's helpful to understand a composition through the lens of these. So right here, we have all the notes in this E major scale. Um, and one thing about scales is they're not all, they're basically all the same. Um, they just use different notes. So if you were to close your eyes and listen to versus say, um, you know, they sound the same, but one's just higher than the other. Um, and so this is more of specifically playing it on a musical instrument. Um, you want to know which notes you have to play. Um, but it doesn't actually really affect the music that you make, just how you would like write it down necessarily. Um, and the other thing, um, we establish one note as say like the home of the musical key, of the of the key. Um, and so in this case, it's E. I hear how it's the basis for all of the notes around. Like it's kind of the grounded note. And uh, this funky thing right here is called the key signature. Um, that's just instructions uh, to the player what notes you need to sharp, or in other cases, what notes you need to flat. Um, yeah. So a scale uh, is the notes of a key that you would play in order. Um, so I've been playing that a bunch. Um, you've been hearing the E major scale. Um, right here, I've got the C major scale. So, however, you'll notice I've got another scale here. And this is with a couple of the notes uh, made flat. And that was, those are going to be E flat, A flat, and B flat. So when you put that together, You know, that sounds kind of more sad, um, more melancholy than the, the other scale um, that I played. And that's, that's kind of because of these three notes that we've changed to make uh, B flat. Um, so yeah, this, this it's one of the big things of writing music, the major versus the minor scales. Um, and so we can, we'll get into that. Um, soon. Um, but now I want to go on to harmony, um, playing multiple notes at once. So right now I've just been playing um, one note at a time, but we can go and do more. And I think this is where things get really fun, because there's so um, much room for expression and uh, creativity within harmony. So um, starting off, uh, intervals. And it, the definition of an interval, uh, it's a space between two things. Um, and in music, we can understand that to be the relationship between two notes. Um, so here I've got the C major scale again. Um, and I've given each one a number. So this one right here is a second, because it goes up. This one is a third, it goes up to the third note, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, Call this one an octave. Um, and you might have already heard this, you know about this, um, but every note on an octave apart from each other is kind of the same note. Um, just the same note, uh, but a different octave. So um, you can also take all of these intervals. We can make them be major or minor. Um, so that minor second is also called a half step. Uh, major second is a whole step. Um, you know, I was talking about that when we were going into, you know, why doesn't a piano just have a black key um, after every note? Um, um, so minor second, half step, same, same, same thing, just different term. There's a lot of that in music. <laughs> um, and just as a quick aside, um, this is totally not important, but I think this is interesting. There's also mathematical ratios b between um, the frequencies of two specific notes. So um, the simpler the ratio, the more harmonious service we call it consonant it is. And the more complex, uh, the more dissonant it is. So an octave, twice the frequency. So don't memorize that. Don't, you don't even need to know this at all. <laughs> I, just, I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, <laughs> 
So um, now going on to chords, so that's going to be anytime we have three or more notes at a time. Um, so we have a triad that's kind of the fundamental building block of harmony. Um, so it's constructed from the root note. So in this case, a C major chord. We're going to start. Um, the root note gives its note. Sorry, the root note gives the chord its name. Um, the third will determine again whether or not it's major or minor. So, um, um, so. <laughs> Um, you can also keep adding notes on top of a chord if you want. Um, you see this a lot in like jazz, for example. Um, and it kind of, it, it can change the feeling of how the chord is. Um, it, I don't know, I think it, it can add volume and power. Make, just, it changes the quality a lot, but not nearly as much as making it major or minor would. Um, it's kind of things additionally on top of that. So here we have a C major 7 chord. And that's kind of like your quintessential jazz chord. Um, you can also add sixth, um, so you can go and do. Um, you can also raise the third from a third to a fourth. And we call that a suspended chord. It looks like this, shortened to sus. So, um, now that we kind of understand all of that, um, and release, because I think this is kind of what music aims to get at, um, is the building of tension through harmony, through rhythm, through notes, and then it resolves that, and you're like, ah. So, but what if I was to go, but hanging, like, you're like, Ugh, what's going on? Um, and, I also sorry. <laughs> um, so that when you're when you're playing that chord, it's like this note just really wants to resolve up to C. So you're on B, and it wants it really just wants to move up to C. And so that's kind of a really basic example of how you build tension and how then you resolve it. Um, and so now we can get into sort of understanding how each chord plays a role in that building of tension or resolving that tension. So, and bear with me here, this is where it gets a little complicated, but we can make a chord um, like with a root note of uh, that for every note of a scale um, where we make the root note for each chord one of those notes of the scale. So. Yeah, our C major chord. Um, so we can give them numbers or numerals. Um, hope you brushed up on your Roman numerals before this, um, where we base it off of their interval to the tonic of the key. So again, we're in C, so our tonic is going to be C, and that's going to be our home. It's where we base everything off of. Um, so, and one other thing, uh, if it's a major chord, it's going to be a capital letter. It's going to be uh, lowercase if it is a minor chord. Um, and so why we do this is because music is in all different keys, but this allows us to talk about how the chords function independently of whatever key we're in. So we can understand it, whether it's in E major or C major, or whatever, um, even like A flat minor. Um, and so that's, we can use that to then find functions for each of these chords. Um, so we use that to understand and construct these chord progressions. Um, and I would say the three most important functions, it's that word again, it's the tonic. Um, this would be our one chord. Um, again, it's our home, it's how we resolve the tension. Um, we have the dominant chord, so that's gonna be the five chord. Um, so, um, and so, it always wants to point back and resolve to the one chord um, whenever you're on that five. But the next step is usually to uh, go back to the one chord. And then we have subdominance, um, which is going to be our two chord and our four chord. And so that's a kind of basic building block of using those 
chords to produce um, tension and then resolve them. You can also do it with the four chord. Um. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, sorry. These generally want to point to the dominant chord um, when, you're on, when you're on those chords, and that's how you get that kind of two, five, one motion. Um, you know, and so this is where it gets really, you know, complicated, and there's so many different options. We can use chords outside of the key we're in. So if we're in C, you know, there's nothing stopping us from having a or you can also make chords that would be minor. So there's an example. The Super Mario Bros. theme is in the key of C, and it starts off with that D major chord, which would be the two chord, which usually is minor, but we make it major, and so it kind of makes it, I don't know, I think it makes it sound cooler and more happy. Um, okay, so now we touched on this a little bit. Chord progressions, um, it's a succession of chords, uh, kind of the foundation of how popular music styles are constructed. You can think of it as a series of chords um, with, you know, of course, many other things. But, you know, you see that in pop, jazz, rock, etc. cetera. Um, so I have something like Faux Bar Blues, and obviously this is... Um, and then one more chord progression that is pretty common, the end and it's in a lot of songs. I couldn't find any good specific examples, but if you keep your ear out, you'll definitely hear it in a lot of songs uh, that are made these, these uh, days. Cool. Um, so, on to melodies. Um, you know, it's kind of the... Really, when you think about music, you think about melodies. Like, you know, we all had the <laughs> Whopper song stuck in our head for the past couple of months. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I, I'd say really what makes good music stand out is a good melody. Um, and so, what makes a good melody good? Um, <laughs> um, and so, I like, you know, you can think about harmony as, it's so, sort of an exact science. There's a lot of like language that you can use to describe what it's doing. Um, there's a system for describing like what's happening. And you can look at that and you can understand like, okay, so this is what they're doing. Um, with melodies, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more abstract. It's a lot more subjective. There's not really, you know, you can't just say, oh, well, this melody, you know, blah blah blah, one five two, major dominant, whatever. Like you can't just do that with melodies and understand um, what they're doing. But what we can do is understand some sort of common themes um, that melodies use um, to, you know, be effective. And so. A big one is repetition, so you'll have a theme, and you'll repeat it. Um, and you can, the general rule of thumb is like you can repeat something three times, and that's beautiful. Um, and you, you can do that, you kind of emphasize the theme, what it's saying. Um, and yeah, you can go from there. So another thing is, oftentimes they'll have a limited pitch range. Um, now there's obviously, there's, there's uh, Exceptions every rule, like the Star Spangled Banner, um, has a range of an octave and a fifth, but it goes all the way up to uh, G. So that's a really big range for like the national anthem of a song. That's, I mean, that stretches for most people like the upper and bottom range of like their vocal range. Um, so a good melody, maybe it's a little bit more compressed. You can sing it a little bit easier, but of course, there's always exceptions. Um, these are limited number of pitches. Like, you know, I'm not just going to go on the keyboard because, you know, at a certain point it gets to be, it's, it's too complicated. Um, we can only hold so many pitches in our head and understand them and assign them meaning. And so you keep it, like for example, you keep it in the key of seven notes. Um, that works pretty well because seven, we can, we can hold on to seven notes pretty well. Um, they also, uh, they, they use, um, let me see. There's two types of motion that you can have in a melody. Um, one is moving with smaller intervals, we can call that stepwise motion. Um, and then there's larger leaps um, where you, the intervals that you jump are larger. So say like a fifth or maybe even an octave. Um, and so they, they have different effects um, on how a melody sounds. So if 
you're moving, you know, say, O to joy, just moving up and down one note at a time. Um, and so you get it, it's more compressed, it's a lot easier to sing, it's more simple, not that, not that that's a bad thing. Um, whereas larger leaps, um, they can often be a lot more emotional, um, very dramatic, um, that kind of thing. Another thing is call and response. So say you have one phrase and you know it goes through a chord progression and it ends on the five chord. And then you go through that progression again, but this time it ends on the one chord. So the five chord kind of calls and then the one chord at the end kind of responds. And I have an example after this uh, that I'll show that I think kind of makes this make more sense. Um, another thing, you know, Harmonization, interesting harmony, I think that makes it more fun to listen to, more cool. Um, but yeah, uh, one more thing, um, a motif. It's more of a, a specific thing. It's a musical theme that we associate with a character, a place, or an idea. Um, and what you can do with this is you use it, say, whenever you want that idea or character to be evoked. Um, and so it goes along with what, whatever is happening on screen. Um, to kind of create a more coherent uh, musical, you know, experience. Um, some good ones, the force theme, and then, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, one more that I've, that's in video games and not a movie that I think is really good um, is the uh, Bowser's theme in Super Mario 64. Um, hopefully this plays. One more idea. Nah. <laughs> well, you saw nothing. You saw, you saw nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, well, the Bowser's theme from, uh, from N64. Um, I think it plays when you like open a door that's locked or something. Um, it also plays whenever you see Bowser. And then for the final boss fight, um, it goes into this like crazy organ version and it like develops the theme. Um, I just think it's super rad. Um, anyway, so uh, the last thing before we go and compose something uh, that I want to go to is just look at some examples of video game music um, and just look how, look how they work um, more specifically. Um, and then, then we'll, we'll keep this moving. So, oh, hello. Guys aren't seeing anything. Don't look at my no. desktop. <laughs> okay, so what we've done so far is we've had like three uh, separate phrases that we've connected to each other um, that repeat twice. Um, and I think part of that was like hardware limitations on the NES. It can only uh, store so much um, musical data. Um, but so see how it has it has these themes that it does. It does them twice, kind of develops upon them, um, and then it moves on to the next one. And then uh, it goes and repeats itself with the dun 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 ba dum bum bum. And then from here, it goes back to that first theme, bum bum bum, and does that. And then, then it goes into a separate phrase, phrase that contrasts what we were he hearing earlier. Um, kind of, it, it repeats some of the earlier phrases, um, some of those ideas, except it changes them, introduces some new notes. Um, and so, yeah, it goes and it repeats that twice. So yeah, so I think that's a really good example 
of kind of the more more of the structure of the music. So the Gusty Garden Galaxy Super Mario 64. Oh my god. Um, this is the melody written out right here. stop it there. I want to go and talk about um, those first phrases because I think there was a lot of really cool stuff happening there. Um, all right, so it starts off with this beginning phrase, um, goes on to the second phrase, um, and so let's look at like kind of more closely what it's doing. So it starts off with this uh, root note. Again, it's in the key of C, so we're starting on our tonic. Um, and we go, da, 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 da. so we, we circle it. So we go down, go down a note, and then up a note, and then go to our second kind of. Um, then we rise up to G, and then go down to F. Uh, and so then we repeat that idea, we, but we do it a little bit higher. So we, we circle it again, we go down to C-sharp, up to E, back down to D, and then kind of do, you know, another phrase. Um, and then, circle it. Same thing again. And do it again. Oh, wait. I'm playing. Whatever. Um, so I think that's a really good kind of example of how to construct a melody with these themes. So you have this bass kind of, and you repeat that, you repeat it on different notes based on the chord that you're playing. So, so we can, there's a good example of how the theme, the da, da, na, 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 interacts with the chords that you're playing. Um, and it creates this really nice melody. Um, so yeah. Those are what I wanted to cover with um, that. Now I want to show you guys uh, the workflow of how one goes about composing a piece of music. Because that can be really daunting and overwhelming at first if you've never tried it before. I want to show you guys. Um, how many of you downloaded MuseScore uh, before this talk? OK, sweet. So I can show you guys kind of how to, how to use that program. Um, and what kind of tools you have available to create music with that. So I'm just fighting with the windows here. Okay, so, um, here's the landing page of MuseScore. Um, by the way, they, so MuseScore 4 just came out like in December. Um, previously we were on MuseScore 3 and this is like head and shoulders way better than um, Anything else? Yeah, what's up? Do you follow the YouTube channel Tech? I love him. Oh my goodness, his videos are so cool. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, for, for those who don't know, Tanner Cool was like, he's just like a YouTuber. Um, and he made some videos on like music software design, one on Sibelius, that one sucks. Um, he made one on MuseScore, and then MuseScore saw him make that video, and then they hired him. And then he became like the lead developer for the project. Um, and so this um, MuseScore 4, I think, is a reflection, a lot of his work um, and his design philosophy. So yeah, Tana Krull on YouTube, definitely look him up. He's got a lot of great videos, um, especially stuff on like design philosophies and all that. Um, so we're gonna start new score. Um, and 
got a lot of options here. Um, we have some templates that we can use. Um, I never really use those, but you're free to. Um, so it allows us to choose our instruments here. Um, and so we got woodwinds, all these woodwinds, brass, uh, percussion. Um, you can have vocals if you want. Um, where is that? Where's kazoo? <laughs> yeah, okay. Do we want a kazoo? <laughs> Kazoo, kazoo subject to change. We'll see how it goes. Um, um, I guess, yeah, do we want to, do you guys want to pick the instruments that we use? We're already dealing with some pipe organ? Hell yeah. <laughs> where, where is that? Oh, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> um, anything else? You want a clarinet? Okay. Um, okay. Trombone? All right. Sweet. Okay, I think this will be, this will be a good little time. <laughs> oh my goodness. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, Thank you. Um, okay, so let's start out. Um, I'm just as a basic kind of first measure. What's up? Cool. Yeah, they revamped the the entire playback for MuseScore Four, and it sounds unbelievable. Oh my goodness, it's like totally re like revitalized my love for writing music because it sounds so much better. Um, but yeah, anyway, so um, we're starting off on E, and then it goes down to B, and then B flat. Ooh. Okay. Um, and okay, I should probably explain what I'm doing here. Um, so uh, when you press N, that activates the note input. So you can press the notes on your keyboard, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, and then it'll input those notes onto the score on the staff that you've selected. So if I want to write, say, uh, oh. oh, one more thing, um, just to make this simpler, click the concert pitch thing in the bottom right here. Um, I don't really want to explain why you need to do that because it's so confusing and I don't even understand it. Um, but different instruments call different notes, different names, and it's a pain. Um, Anyway, so yeah, you select the clarinet um, and you want to, you press N, that activates the note input. And so uh, you can click up here, you can select all of these different note values. So, you know, whole note, half note, quarter note. Um, so let's say you want to write some eighth notes. Um, so there you go. There you have some. Uh, yeah, so that's that kind of the basics. Um, you can also press like one through nine on your uh, keyboard to change the note value. I think quarter note is five, should be four, but that's not the world we live in. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna keep laying down kind of this bass line in the organ. Oh, you can also use the, uh, arrow keys um, on your keyboard to move them up and down. Yeah, what's up? Um, yeah, are you, so I haven't been able to figure out how to connect this thing and have it like go directly into MuseScore. That, they say that's something you can do. I don't fully understand it, but right now I'm just typing notes on my like actual computer keyboard um, for note input. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, so, yeah, whole notes, just four of these. Yeah, cool. Um, and then, you know, maybe some chords up here. 
Uh, and to do chords, you can do press shift with the notes that you're playing. I'm sorry, I don't know why they're holding over. That's so loud. Um, yeah, there's a lot of keyboard shortcuts that I'm using um, that I guess aren't immediately intuitive. Um, but they're all easily uh, available to look up. So stuff like changing the octave of a note, control up or down, I think. Um, yeah. And yeah, so like that. if you've got any questions of like, what on earth did you just do? Um, feel free to ask. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna lay down. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot to add a key signature. Um, so at the beginning, um, go over the side menu right here. It's got all the key signatures. Um, we're in E major, so I'm gonna collect the one with four sharps. Um, and there we go. So now we should be good. Um. So. Yeah, time signatures. Um, so that's something I didn't touch on um, because I thought it was. Um, more uh, easier to understand if we just operate in 4-4. Four, four. So you've got four beats in a measure. Um, so we're talking about that strong beat and that weak beat. Um, the strongest one is on the first, and then there's four notes, and then we're back to that strong beat. Uh, but you can also have um, time signatures that aren't 4-4. Four, four. So the most common one is 3-4. Um, oh my goodness, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you why I needed that in a second. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you have multiple. Um, so for three, four, you've got three beats in a measure. So it's like one, two, three, two, one, two, three. And so that strong beat is on one, and you have two beats instead of uh, three after that. Um, those are by far the most common ones that you will see. Um, there's occasionally five, four. If you've heard uh, Mars by Holst, that's in five, four. It's very cool. Take five by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, also in 5-4. So that's going to have five beats in a measure. Really sucks to play. Um, and then there's stuff like 2-4, uh, 6-8. There's a difference between 6-8 and 3-4, I promise. Um, the, this bottom number means uh, what note value gets the beat. So in 4-4, the quarter notes get the beat. In, say, 6-8, the eighth notes get the beat. And there's six of them. Um, so I, that's that's kind of the basic thing of, of time signatures, um, but they're not super important. The reason I needed the sixty three thirty two bar is just for um, excuse me, uh, just just this, because oh. <laughs> otherwise there would have been an extra thirty second note to rest at the very end, and I wanted to get rid of that, so I made sixty three thirty two. Um, whoa, that's funky. Um, yeah, because this key, this, uh, this note uh, has none of the notes that are in the key of E major, so they're all different. This, uh, this guy right here means natural, so instead of um, being sharped in the key of E, we take it down from being sharp to being natural. So that's going to put it back on a white key. Um, so a little detail. Um, and then, yeah. Um, the new playback is a little buggy, so you get those weird notes holding over. I'm not exactly sure why it does that or how to fix it, but that's the thing it does. Um, so, yeah, so here we have our bass chords. Um, 
Um, and I'm feeling I want some harmonic movement in this last chord. So um, I'm going to take these two notes, take them down to the uh, seven of that E flat major chord. Um, so that's going to be that seven chord again. And then, um, okay, so we got two measures here of that, um, so like I said, new software, kind of janky, kind of really janky. Don't know how to get them to be on the same window anymore. <laughs> Um, but anyway, okay, so we have our chords and they loop twice. So now we can go and play some melodies. Which instrument uh, do we think should get the melody here? There we go. Great. Well, that doesn't sound like a kazoo. It does sound like a. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll just, we'll give it just quarter rest so that way it has to look at it. Oh, actually, no, I'll, I'll tell you what we can do. I'll tell you what we can do for extra punishment. Um, where is it? Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Rest, but louder. <laughs> that is overpowering everything. Yeah, so there's a mixer here, which is kind of cool. So you can adjust the mix of all your instruments. Um, not sure why this isn't really playing. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, 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 oh yeah, one thing I didn't touch on, um, dotted notes add half of the note value to what they are. So this dotted half note is going to be three beats because it's half note, two beats, plus half one. So you get three. Um, Um, yeah, I know, we're, we're all very disappointed in this. Um, it, it, in real life, yes, it is. Um, I just put it that way because if, because it defaults to, uh, mezzo forte, and for some reason, like, trombone is almost inaudible when it's on mezzo forte, so I guess I could make that just normal forte. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, yeah, you are. Um, so yeah, so if I wanted to insert an instrument, um, I just click this add button right here. Um, and so I don't know if I wanted hand claps or something. 
Uh, sorry, that didn't do it. <laughs> One second. Um, what's up? Are you like, like, import? Yes. Um, so that's there's something called a sound font, um, which is, you know, the font for the sounds that it produces. Um, and so, yeah, what you can do is, yeah, you could download a song. I'm not exactly sure how you'd go about swapping the um, instrument, but I, I'm sure you could Google it and find it, figure that answer out. Um, basically what that does is uh, there's a thing called MIDI. It's like the music, um, inter musical instrument digital interface. Um, and it's a way, so like, my, you know, my piano is connected to my computer. Um, it sends like a bunch of like note on and note off values with like specific pitches um, to a computer. Um, but the thing about it is it doesn't have any sound. It's just, it's just information that says like this note is on now, this note is off now. Um, and so then you need something else to give that sound. So for a score program like this, it's going to be a, um, a sound font. If you're working with the digital audio workstation, you probably use a VST. Um, I forget what that stands for, but it's, it has a list of instruments and stuff that you can select. There's many of them. Some are better than others. Um, but that's, that's definitely uh, one thing that you, yeah, you can do. Okay, so here's our here's our first little melody right here. Oh, hold on. So that's our first phrase. Yeah, give me a second. Oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, so I finished this up. Okay, so, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a basic melody that we put together using some really janky chords um, and a pipe organ and a trombone. Um, but, you know, I guess, I guess my advice is um, break rules, um, try, try new things. Um, if you can hear where you want it to go, um, let it take you where, wherever it wants to go. Um, one skill that you do need to have um, is understanding how to translate what you hear in your head onto what's on the page, um, whether that's in notes or rhythms. I know I really struggle with getting the rhythms right. Um, and there's nothing I can really say other than you need to do that, you need to practice that, um, and it'll get easier over time. Um, I guess like, you know, tapping a beat and trying to figure out where that rhythm lies can help. Um, but it's just a skill that comes with time. So, yeah. Um, I guess we don't have anything with a hand clap. We want something with that. Uh, 
Oh, this thing is so janky. <laughs> You guys, oh my goodness. Um, so I broke everything, but so give me a second. Like yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll upload it right after this is done. Will this do what I think it will? <laughs> Yeah, let me let me lay on a let me lay on a beat though. This is gonna be a great beat. <laughs> oh, <that one. laughs> Oh, okay, here we go. It's like a trap beat. <laughs> You know. <laughs> it just glitches out of the area. Oh. <laughs> um, I haven't seen it. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's yeah. just about um, all I've really got for this. That I, feel, I mean, obviously, there's so much more. Uh, this is only scratched the surface. But I hope this has been helpful somewhat in you know, understanding how people write music, how music works, that type of stuff. Yes? Oh, OK. Sorry. I thought we were raising a hand. Um, yeah, so I guess that's that. Anybody have any closing questions? Yeah, ooh, um, bass clarinet, bass clarinet. Cause, what? Well, yeah, so I played clarinet and then in like eighth grade I switched to bass clarinet and that shit is amazing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Favorite game? Um, the game that I have the most hours on is Kerbal Space Program. What's your favorite, what's your favorite game? Um, gotta be Super Mario Galaxy. Yeah. Gussie Garden Galaxy alone carries. I love the, the opening theme from that game. It's so good. Um, the credits roll. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a really big fan of Michael Giacchino's, I don't know say his last name was work. The guy who did um, The Incredibles, oh, Rogue yeah. One. Oh. John Williams, obviously. Um, I, God, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good composers out there. And I, um, I oh, I love uh, Snarky Puppy. That's a good one. Um, it's more of a, a jazz fusion type band. Lingus has like the best um, keyboard solo of the past like 20 years in it. I also really love Adam Neely on YouTube. Um, that guy, I, I totally owe most of what I know about music theory to watching his videos. They're really well made, informative, have a lot of interesting perspectives on the role of music um, in society. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of good, good people out there. I, I, too many for me to list, honestly. Um, I, okay, um, okay, we're done. Um, <laughs> but I, I also, I don't want you guys to think that I suck at writing music because I just created this. Um, <laughs> I do want to play, um, want to play something that I'm working on currently. Uh, and it, it shows off the, uh, Muse score playback really well. Um, here we go. Yeah, so this is something I've, I've had, um, kind of in my head for a while. Um, and after, uh, this new Muse score update, I'm like, holy cow, I can totally work with this.
all I've got so far. It's a work in progress. <laughs>